and the great big solo board gaming welcome to Charlemagne, Master of Europe from Hollandspiel. So, welcome to a review and play demo of Charlemagne, Master of Europe from Hollenspiel Games. I'm just going to start with an overview and then we'll start zooming in and we'll do one, at least one, complete turn with a full sequence of play. And at the moment, I'm halfway through a game. We will begin turn eight and this is what the map looks like at that period of the game turn eight so we can explain some of the mechanics and sort of review those mechanics as we go along now first of all some fundamentals we did an unboxing uh a few days ago and maybe you might want to pop back and take a look at that because that's where we had a look at the components the counters the map in detail but the first thing to say before we go any further is it's a beautiful looking game it looks absolutely wonderful the artwork both on the map and on the counters is off the scale it really is fabulous and very very thematic so basic things um charlemagne master of europe uses the three cup system so you will need three cups that you'll be using all of the while. Plus, you'll need a fourth cup, and this is it over here, in which to place all of your enemy combat units. So this is the, let's have a quick look, uh, the sort of silver gray units that represent the enemy armies for when you do battle. So that's the fourth cup and set that over to the side by the battle display over here. So, back to the three cups, the three cup system. And at the moment there are chips in each of them and the setup of the game not only guides you through uh, how to place units on the map, but you'll be placing them on the map by drawing them from the cups basically anyway, apart from the game markers. Now the three cups from left to right are the friendly cup, the unfriendly cup, and the hostile cup. Oh yes, so from good to bad. And with the three cup system, you will be dipping into these cups as a consequence of each and every single action you take. And we'll explain that in a while and you'll actually see it happening. But you're going to be dipping your hand blindly into these three cups for the entirety of the game, all of the time. It's the main thing you'll be doing because you'll be moving blindly, as I say, counters from the friendly cup to the unfriendly cup. You can imagine that. During your reign, you are creating a certain amount of tension and unrest. So today's friends could become a little bit unfriendly. Worse than that. And much more often, you'll be moving units from the unfriendly cup to the hostile cup. So the hostile cup will be filling up. And of course, you'll be drawing at the end of each and every action that you carry out. <laughs> As a consequence, you'll be drawing units, counters from the hostile cup and placing them in their position on the map and they become map units and they become enemies and you have to deal with those and you'll end up spinning lots and lots of plates as you're trying to keep these enemy units at bay as you defeat enemy units they'll be going into the dead pool there's a dead pool here look and at the end of a battle and every end of turn phase, 
which is almost a game in itself, you'll be placing units from the Deadpool back into the cups. Many of them will go into the hostile cup again. Some of them will go into the unfriendly cup. And occasionally you might get some back into the friendly cup. You could take some actions that the population may even like. In which case you may move units from the unfriendly cup back into the friendly cup. So that's the three cup system and it's a constant movement, a balance between these three cups all the way through the game and you are moving counters blindly between them and eventually bringing them onto the map. And it's stemming that tide that is key to the game or one of the keys to the game. So before we have a closer look at the map, one last thing, just one more thing about the rule book. It's amazing. We had a good look at it in the unboxing video, but it's easy to read. It's amusing, typically. It's a joy. It's just not a problem. It's easy to get through these rules. But you'll only truly understand them as you play them out on the map. Now, for the first two, three, four turns of the game, and there will be 12 turns in every single game. So the, for the first two, three, four turns, you'll be referring to the rule book. And just a tip, I think, my personal opinion only, that it's best to always refer to the turn end phase from the rule book. And then you'll follow it exactly and you won't miss parts of that turn end phase out. And that's certainly what I'm doing now. I tend to be not using the rule book except for the turn end phase. And I probably always will because it's fairly complex because for the rest of the game, there's the fantastic uh, player aid chart or player aid. Look at that. And really it's got most everything on there that you need. First of all, uh, you've got the sequence of play and it starts with the levy phase, except for turn one. There isn't a levy phase in turn one. Then the campaign phase. Now, that's where you're going to be uh, moving and taking actions all around the board. And all of those actions are going to result in you drawing from the hostile cup and bringing enemies out onto the map and then carrying out other actions. You can carry out many, many actions during a single campaign turn. So that's your campaign phase. And what you'll find is in the Hostile Cup, you start off with two turn end counters. Okay, two end turn counters. And when you blindly draw, a turn end counter, you place it there in the Deadpool. And when you eventually draw the second turn end counter, you place that in the Deadpool and the campaign round ends. The turn doesn't, but the campaign round and therefore your actions for the round end. And eventually at the end turn phase, those will go back into the Hostile Cup. Now, one thing on that, before I forget and before we move on, when you first set up the game, you'll place a turn end counter there on turn four and another turn end counter there on turn eight. And as you come to them to take turn four and then turn eight, you put a third turn end counter into the cup and here, a fourth turn end counter into the cup. So as you progress through the game, it stands to reason if your campaign phase ends when a second end turn counter is drawn from the hostile cup, by this time you've got four of them in the hostile cup. So your turns are gonna get shorter and shorter. Your chance to do that campaigning and carry out actions from mid-game are going to get shorter and shorter. So just quickly, 
to go back then to the player aid. Uh, you've then got a build phase. You can build roads. You can build churches. You've then got your diplomacy phase and your turn end phase that I keep talking about. And it's that turn end phase for which you need the rule book. These are all the actions that you can carry out during your turn. You can suppress. Uh, when I say during your turn, this is during the campaign phase. You can suppress battle, forced march. You can make a gift. You can lay siege. You can build a marquee. That sounds like putting up a tent. It's not that. <laughs> So I phrased that wrong. You can create a marquee, an assistant, a local ruler on behalf of Charlemagne's government. Or you can forcibly convert pagans. So those are all the actions that you can take. To which, as I suggested, there's always hostile reactions. And these are all the possibilities here. Hostile reactions as you draw hostiles out of the hostile cup. This will show us what to build, how to carry out diplomacy, how to manage our money and how to go through the turn end phase and where we get our victory points from. Absolutely essential. But this player aid, I assure you, will run the entire game. Love it. It's wonderful. So how was setting up the game? Very easily explained in the rule book. Really easy to follow step by step. And at the completion of setup, Amabel says in the rule book, whew, that's the setup done kind of thing. But no, it was easy. It was pleasurable. Watching the map be populated by these fantastic looking counters with its medieval artwork. It's a sheer joy and it really brought a smile to my face. And it started to create a picture of the struggle that we're about to go through. If you look at the top left of the board, you start with your turn track here. And it goes from one to a total of 12 rounds in the game. And the length of each round will vary depending on when you pull that second end turn counter from the hostile cup, as we explained a few minutes ago. So for the first half of the game, the rounds tend to be longer, but they may not be. And for the second half of the game, they tend to get shorter because of the additional end turn markers in the hostile cup. So here you have round one, two, three, four, five, and so on. The reason I'm drawing your attention to them in each square for each round, there are three additional numbers. There's a number in a circle in the corner here, for instance, it's 11. There it's nine. Here it's 12, 13, 15, 18, and so on, increasing. And that number in the circle is your taxation level. Your goal each turn is to reach that taxation level. If you do reach that taxation level within that turn, by the diplomatic phase, you'll get emergency victory points here. See, at the moment I'm on four. You'll get emergency victory points and they can help you reach your victory point threshold each turn, if necessary, in an emergency. Now, you don't have to reach that tax threshold. It's just that if you don't, you're not going to get emergency victory points. Now, at the moment, for instance, we look down here, my tax, my taxes are currently sitting at 15 per turn. I didn't quite make the 18 threshold last turn, so I didn't get additional emergency victory points. But that's fine. The second number here in a shield, like here it says 20, 24, 28, 32, 36, 40, they got, that's your military strength, the strength of your army. And that's the threshold 
you need to reach at the end of that particular turn. So here, for instance, you'd need to have reached 32 army strength points by the end of the turn. If you don't reach that number because you've lost a lot in battle, for instance, then you pay for the difference in victory points. Yeah, you can lose victory points. So if you're under strength by two military units, you would lose two victory points. And now finally, <laughs> and this is the whole point of the game, and this is the most important of those three little numbers in each and every single turn. It's the one at the bottom in the golden laurel wreath. Look, uh, you start off at three and that's eight. These are victory points, eight victory points. What's that? 13, 19, 25, 35, 45. You have to have reached that victory point threshold by the end of that turn. If you haven't, then you must make up the difference with emergency victory points and your emergency victory points go down as you use them to make up that difference. So that's why those are important. If you remember, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. And if you still can't make up that victory point threshold at the end of that turn, you cannot progress to the next turn. You lose the game. As simple as that. So you've not only got all these things going on, on the board, you've got these thresholds to consider. The top two may not be critical, but they're important. But the bottom one there, the victory point threshold is critical. If you don't reach it, you lose the game there and then. Amazing drama going on just on the turn track. Okay, the next thing on our tour around the map is this diplomacy section here. Now you'll use this during each diplomacy phase. And it's very self-explanatory. It's on the player's aid as well. And first of all, you resolve any Vikings that are on the map. Now, as I said, at the moment, I'm just about to start turn eight. For the last two turns, Vikings have started to appear, but I've dealt with them. Then you have Al-Andalus, and this is how you're going to deal with the Moors, which will advance upon you from the Spanish march. So from the south of Spain, they'll advance and encroach upon your kingdom and upon your empire. If and when you allow them to reach Poitiers, game over. So the middle game starts getting really interesting and full of danger. And that's what we're in now, the middle game. And for the again, for the past two or three turns, since about turn five, maybe six, the Moors have been starting to come onto the map. This is because they have been moving through the cups and, and have entered the hostile cup. So they start appearing here. Now, when that happens, Al-Andalus can change from peace. I don't know if you can see that. That side says peace. And on the other side, as they appear, tension. You see, at the moment, we're on peace. Although there is one moor on the map down here. Then we have Byzantine, the Eastern Empire of Byzantium, again challenging the right to exist, the Western Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, challenging your right to exist. And that can change from peace to tension. And you have to deal with Byzantium. And again, the past couple of turns, Byzantium has started to take an interest, but they're still both at peace at this moment. Then England. Now, that what that's short for really is the emergency victory points up here that we explained a few minutes ago. If your taxation level each turn matches the threshold on the, the turn track at the time, you gain an emergency victory point. Funding, if you like from the Christian kingdoms in England, just across the water. And then finally, you have Vatican, 
where your approval rating can increase and we could be crowned Holy Roman Emperor. But more about that very, very shortly. Now, quickly, the Deadpool. As we take out each action and hostiles come out from the hostile cup onto the map and become enemies, when we deal with those enemies by suppressing them, by laying siege to them, by gifting them to go away, then those enemy counters end up here in the Deadpool temporarily until the, the conclusion of a battle or until the end of the game turn, in which case you manage the Deadpool and they go into the occasionally friendly cup, more often the unfriendly cup, and all the pagans, for instance, will go into the hostile cup. So they're refreshed again, ready to come back and assault us next turn. Except here, just move that, this is your permanent Deadpool. And in the permanent Deadpool, it does what it says on the tin. Any court intrigue you deal with throughout the game, assassination attempts and that kind of thing, if you've dealt with it successfully, it goes into the Deadpool, stays there permanently in this bottom section, and you score with it each and every turn, as does your Iron Crown as King of Lombardy, which you will probably try to defeat in battle. There he is, the former King of Lombardy. You'll try and defeat him in battle, probably in your first turn, to gain the Iron Crown of Lombardy. And that stays permanently in the bottom section of the Deadpool and you score with it each and every turn. Now, the last section's here, just in the bottom left-hand corner. Your marquee counters. These are the guys that are gonna, these are your subordinates that are gonna help you out. Until I've created them, I keep them there. It reminds me what to do. Each one to place costs six coins. That's so quite expensive. But as you do so, it'll raise your taxes by two. And during the build phase, if you get to build bridges or roads, you can flip your marquee counter once it's on the map, not when it's sitting here, <laughs> to the side that's got a crown on it to show that that region now has roads and bridges. Here, your churches are stacked. You start with four here. I've built three of them, so I've only got one left here to build. And we'll come on to that later. Now, here is your battle board. Your force pool is here. Now, this is your pool of forces and at the beginning of every turn, there's a levy phase where you can buy, if you can afford them, additional military units to place in your military reserves, which are here. Here are the infantry, here are the cavalry, the household cavalry, our bodyguard, which tend to be quite expensive, but they're really good at fighting. And I've got level one, two and three infantry and level two and three cavalry after a battle you can promote for instance any, well you can promote any unit up to the next level one from the your left wing and one from your right wing but any cavalry i believe they're called scara that get promoted to level four that's level three that's level four any that get promoted to level four during the end turn phase, retire. But in doing so, you also earn from that. So it's a good thing to promote to level four if you possibly can. However, remember the thresholds on the turn marker track. One of them is military strength. You need to keep enough forces down here to meet your military 
threshold requirement. Again, you're balancing, you're spinning plates. And when you come to do a battle, for instance, when you want to fight for the Iron Crown here in Lombardy, the enemy forces arraign before you here and here. You place them first and then you can place your own forces, your own choice of what type of unit and what level of unit you place where. But you place them on your left flank, your right flank to combat the enemy forces. You can fight and maneuver. You also have to defend. You will take losses, but hopefully you'll win. Don't get too cocky because if you lose one battle, again, game over. You've lost. Your empire has crumbled. Now, let's start putting all that together and take a look at our dispositions for the start of turn eight. So we'll have a look at each section in a moment, but meanwhile, this is the overview. Charlemagne is here. That's where he ended the last turn in Bavaria. Here we have the Saxons and there's some nasty piles of them here. They've all built up. Here we have Moravians, Avars and Croats. These brown and orange enemy counters are the pagan regions and will give you most trouble throughout the whole game. Down here, we have the Italian states, the papal states, because it goes as far north as Bavaria there in southern Germany. Here, of course, is Rome, where sits the Pope. These are our heartlands. Here we have northern France and the Low Countries where we have a marquee. Here we have Western France and the Spanish March, where we have a marquee. We have also three churches. We built three churches or cathedrals. I like to think of them as one here and you place them in the circle, one here and one here in Northern Italy. And finally, down here, we have the Papal States. We have the Pope in Rome. We've built a cathedral. When we became King of Lombardy, we placed this reminder chit on the map. I don't know if you can see that. That says minus one die roll modifier. Because as King of Lombardy, any battles such as sieges and suppression that we're carrying out in these areas as enemies spring up, we get a plus one, I think I said minus one, didn't I? Should be plus one, <laughs> die roll modifier. So that makes it easier for us to, to defeat enemies in this area. Why? Because we're king of Lombardy. We have the Iron Crown. Now, my papal approval has reached plus two. Can we see that? Plus two. It starts off at minus one. Then you go to zero. When you receive the Iron Crown of Lombardy, you go to plus one. Just once in the game where you've achieved a victory point threshold on any of one of the turns. So that's quite easy. And then finally you get plus two approval when you've built three churches. And we finished our third church last turn, turn seven. So our papal approval modifier is plus two, which means if Charlemagne can reach Rome by the end of our campaign turn this turn, he can be crowned Holy Roman Emperor. And that will be our goal for this turn. Yes, so let's do the turn. Turn eight, play demo of Charlemagne, Master of Europe. Let's go. Now I hope I can do this demo uh, while at the same time, because it's only gonna be one turn you see. And yet I want to 
show as many of the mechanics that I possibly can. And I was thinking of doing a forced conversion. First of all, I must say, by the end of the turn, no, sorry, by the end of the campaign phase, I must be here because I can only become Holy Roman Emperor in the diplomacy phase. So I must end my movements here. I could travel straight down there, but then again, I'm not carrying out any other actions and I'm not earning money and I'm not, you know, that kind of thing. So first of all, let's try something. I want to do a forced conversion. I think, you know, this is the first opportunity I've had. I can't quite recall. And by that, I mean, I'm going to try it because I'm not doing too bad for victory points at the moment. I think I have... Uh, oh, 60. Uh, I've got to be careful because at the top here, my victory point threshold at the end of this turn is 60. But if I forcibly convert some of these, and you can forcibly convert them, by the way, by massacring them. Yeah, I know. This Charmaine chap was a great guy, but he certainly wasn't PC. Don't judge him. As of today, this kind of thing went on, I'm afraid, all across the world. So Charlemagne is going to take, he needs to get here or here or here. He's going to take an action, and that action is forced march. In forced march, there's no changes to the cups, but there is one hostile reaction. Why? Because around Europe, around the Empire, they know Charlemagne's on the move. So not too happy about it. The hostile reaction is Poitiers. Okay, Poitiers. Okay, so that goes there. That's an enemy that's just been spawned in the box. Poitiers. Now I can take another action. By the way, you can take actions with either Charlemagne or any of your Marquis characters. So Charlemagne will now go. Ah, oh, oh, taking a risk. Okay. Charlemagne will now go here and carry out the forced conversion. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to roll. Forced conversion can only be done in pagan regions. It just requires you to be there to be more than one enemy unit in the box. And there'll only be one hostile reaction. Which is surprising. Because this is probably the most violent act that Charlemagne can carry out. And that is to forcibly massacre these guys. And the reason I want to do that is because when I move, I just want to leave the area safe behind me. This is what happens. First of all, the guys in the box are massacred. They go in the Deadpool. And it all are massacred in any box adjacent to the one that you are currently forcibly converting. So they get massacred. And they get massacred. So why have I done it? Well, as I said, it's now emptied the area behind me. But because I've massacred six chits of enemy, I've got a minus six victory points. I have to minus six victory points so i go from 60 to 54 is that right yeah so i've still got to make up at least six victory points to be able to progress to the next turn <laughs> so that was a bit of a risk but see how it's cleared the board behind me now there's one hostile reaction so that's one counter out of the hostile cup squiggle squiggle what do we have I knew it. I knew it. Saxons 2. 
and that's here. There's already a leader on it. So it goes underneath the leader. Those Saxons are really building up. So before every action, if there's room, you get a free move. There's my free move, but now I must take an action. And the action is forced march. So I'm back there again. Forced march, there's no cup changes, but we do draw one hostile. What's this? Burgundy. Burgundy. So that goes in the Burgundy box as an enemy. I continue my move. Look, I can keep carrying out actions, remember, for as long as I don't draw two end turn markers. So I am risking it. So here goes. I'm going to do the same again. Take my free move. Then forced march. It's forced march, there's no cup changes. Oh, I know what I should have done. When I did the forced conversion, I should have done one cup change. And that's from unfriendly to hostile. And that makes sense, doesn't it? So I'll do it now. Squiggle, squiggle. From the unfriendly cup into the hostile. Okay, done that. So now we'll do our hostile draw. Squiggle, squiggle. Oh, Moravia. And we've got the first enemy back in Moravia. Now, here goes. I've marched into the land of the Veliti and I'm gonna lay siege to this stack. It's a stack of three with a leader and the leader is plus two. Now, the way we do that is this. So the leader is a plus two. Now to lay siege, I must roll greater than the leader bonus. Uh, no, sorry, greater than double the leader bonus. The leader bonus there, look, is a plus two. I have to roll greater than double, so at least five on a d8 to be successful in the siege. If I'm unsuccessful, I have to stay there and keep sieging that stack until we're victorious. Until we're victorious, we cannot move. So, greater than double, so that's five or more on your d8. Three, no good. So being unsuccessful, it tells me first of all that two unfriendly, uh, sorry, two friendly units from the friendly cup have to go into the unfriendly cup. One, two, and I'm going to draw two hostiles because of the action I just took. Okay. The first is intrigue. Now I have to deal with that, but remember I've got to draw another hostile. But first of all, we have to try and deal with the intrigue. Now to do that, Again, consult the player aid. Intrigue chit drawn. I hope you can see that. First of all, if I meet the victory points threshold for the current turn, defeat the intrigue. I don't, because I've just lost victory points. You're kidding me. Taxation. If your taxation level meets or exceeds the difference between victory points and the victory points threshold, defeat the intrigue. If my taxation level meets or exceeds the difference, my taxation level is 15. Yes, I'm only six short of the victory points threshold, 
So it does defeat the intrigue. Thank goodness for my taxation at least. But you can see how that forced conversion could have got me into a lot of trouble because I lost so many victory points. But at least now I defeat the intrigue. And the intrigue goes into the dead pile, but in the permanent dead pile. So while I was away sieging, I've also defeated another assassination attempt. Loving it. Now, don't forget, I've got to still draw one more hostile. Oh, gosh. Uh, Carinthia. So they're starting to build again. But do you notice something? If I hadn't have massacred all the people behind me, by now, the stacks would be getting three units on them. And soon, the leaders would be coming out, taking away victory points from me anyway. So these are the decisions you're making all the time. Now, try a siege again. Got to get a five or more. Seven. Oh, don't think you've seen it. Seven. Seven. We've been successful. So we've killed the leader and the topmost unit. So that reduces that stack to two. Now, the leader was worth two. There it is. Okay. So we earn two gold. And see how we're populating the Deadpool look. There are our forced conversions, otherwise known as massacres. And there, <laughs> ah, and there are the Saxons we've just besieged. Now, so where's my cash? There you go. My cash goes from three to four, five. I've now got five cash. It was a successful siege. So one unfriendly becomes a friendly. So we change the cups there. But... Everyone's heard about this. Two more hostiles come out. Here they are. One is Moravia again. Okay, Mora I'm surprised, you know, because there's four end turn markers in there. I'm surprised you've not had one out yet. Lombardy. Down here. Now, one more go. Come on, Paul. One more go. I'm going to go. I'm going to. Well, I'm going to try one more siege and then run for Rome. So, oh, I've got to roll greater than double his bonus, which is a plus two. So I've got to roll a five or more. And in fact, I get a bonus for an eight. I don't just take off the top two. The whole stack goes into the dead pile. And I get the two gold from the leader token. Yowza, how about that? So into the, de Oops. Into the dead pile, they go. Add two more gold. So I'm now up to seven. And I've just had an idea. I just hope I can manage it without drawing an end of turn. Let me just tidy these up a little bit. Okay, I've just tidied up uh, things here a bit. Now, so I added my cash. I've now got seven. I've got to draw. Ah, it was successful, wasn't it? So one unfriendly now goes into the friendly. It's one of the few occasions, you know, when it goes the other way. But the reaction is two hostiles. Oh dear. And oh dear. So uh, where are we? Um, Saxons. Saxons won. There's already a leader. So he'll go underneath. Or really underneath the leader. So 
and the other one was Croats. So they're over here. So now I've got to move quickly. Now, he'll move here because I want to come down here, you see. So we'll just try and do a suppress action here. Now with suppress, his value, his strength is six. I just need to beat it. So a seven or eight will do it. Four, no good. But one friendly becomes unfriendly and it's a hostile reaction of two draws. Oh, there's our first end turn. The end turn marker goes in the dead pool. If we draw a second, the campaign phase is over. And the other one was Vikings. This is difficult to see, this medieval illustration here. Can we see it now, do you think? It's Viking longships. Obviously taken from some illustration somewhere, some manuscript. That's lovely. So the Vikings, when they come out, they will always go in this section here. So I'm going to place them there. That is, if there's three Vikings already there, they would go into the blue area instead, right into the heartland of our Frankish Empire. And then it starts becoming really bad news. So we don't want to let them build up if we can possibly help it. And they don't go in a circle. They don't go in a box. They just go off grid onto the map like so. While there's Vikings around, we can't build and that kind of thing. And the only way we can get rid of Vikings is in the diplomacy stage. There's no other way of doing it. Okay, I'm on the run now. We've already taken one end turn token out. There could be another one ready to come out. So there's my free move. And now my forced march. There's no cup changes and one hostile reaction. We don't want end turn. Not now, not yet. Not now, not yet. <laughs> oh no, okay, we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. It's, who's this? Okay, it's Corinthia. You see, the pagans on this border are building up again now. I've got to come down here. I could bypass, ah, oh, nah. My action is going to be to create a marquee. Yes. Take the marquee. He'll be my assistant in this area. Place him in the box. It costs, it costs a lot of money, but I've managed to gather some money, haven't I? So now pay six, which only leaves me one gold coin, because six is the cost of the marquee. They can carry out actions instead of me, but their actions aren't so powerful. But my main reason for doing that is you need a marquee in a region to be able to build roads and bridges, and that's what I want to do ultimately. So doing that, an unfriendly, comes out and goes in the friendly cup, but two hostiles, darn it, darn it, darn it. Okay, two hostiles. One. Two. What's happening in the Italian states down here? Look, they're both green. Lombardy. And Bavaria. But we can deal with those later. I need to keep moving. There's my free move. Suppress. I have to roll greater than greater than four to two. <laughs> Didn't work. One friendly <sighs> becomes unfriendly. And there's two hostile <laughs> two hostile reactions. Oh, grief. What's this yellow now? Oh, Poitiers again. 
So the enemies are building up in the west. And the second one. Oh, purple. We don't get those too often. There aren't so many of them, you see. Breton. You see that? Lovely artwork. Breton. So he goes there. I have a marquee there already, look. So he'll be able to deal with him later. But we're going to press on. Got to keep moving. Now, you can only take a siege action if there's a leader in the stack. Here, there isn't. So all I can do here really is suppress. So I have to roll greater than six. But because I have the Iron Crown of Lombardy, I get a plus one. So, greater than six, <gasps> an eight. Hello. Now, as far as I know, if I'm remembering correctly, Charlemagne eliminates everyone he suppresses. So both of those now end up in the Deadpool. Like so. Good move. But with suppression, a friendly becomes unfriendly. This is constant, isn't it? I said you'll be doing this all the time. And now there's two hostile reactions. This is what I just need, please. One more move. What? Oh no, Vikings again. That might not be good when we get to the diplomacy stage. Vikings, there's one there, there's not three. So he goes alongside him. They're building up, they're hitting my coastline over there. And the next one is Corinthia again. That's the third one. Now, if a fourth one comes out for Corinthia, you'll become a leader on top of that stack. We don't want leaders. And at last, I have a move. Uh, oh, that's right. It would have to be a forced march. There's no unfriendlies there. And here I am in Lerm. Forced march is one hostile comes out. No. No, I didn't mean it to be. I did not. <laughs> No, okay, a turn end. <laughs> so the campaign phase finishes. Hey, look, this is a play demo. This game isn't being scored, it's a play demo. <laughs> right, I hopefully I've demonstrated what I was up against. Pushing my luck all the time. Push my luck. Push my luck. Trying to defeat leaders to get a bit more coin, which meant I could appoint a marquee. I could make my way to Rome because the ultimate goal is to be crowned Holy Roman Emperor this turn. So the second turn end token has finished the campaign phase. We're now onto the build phase, but hey, look, I'm right down to just one gold piece. I can't build anything because all three options require three gold coins, bridges and roads, finish a church or start a church. By the way, I've seen some people discussing whether you can start and finish a church in the same turn. No, you can't. Churches, cathedrals, cathedrals took years, decades to build. This is designed so that you finish a church before you start another church. In other words, you can't start a church and then finish one as the next action. It has to be done over two turns. And that makes 
all the sense. So now it's diplomacy phase. First of all, how do we deal with Vikings? Well, if your area has a marquee, one of the Vikings is defeated, goes into the Deadpool. You can pay the other off with a coin and you have to pay as many coin as there are Vikings in your area. Imagine if there was three, luckily there's one left. So I have to pay my very last coin to get rid of that Viking. And you really need to keep doing this guys. As you see, we had two there already that could have become three and they could start moving into the center of our empire here. So that's what the threat is. It's not the odd Viking that's the threat. It's the fact that you mustn't allow them to build up. So they are gonna cost you money and you do need a marquee to get rid of them. Imagine if we hadn't a marquee in that coastal area. The next section is Al Andalus. Luckily we're at peace. And we have one Moors counter on the map, down here in the map. I'm amazed more Moor didn't come out onto the map from the hostile cut this turn, you know, and, and, and we're growing up here, but we're still left with that one. Now, how do we get rid of him? We roll a die and add the Papal Approval Modifier. Now, luckily this is easy. If there are four Moors here, it could start becoming difficult. And we have a, pa a papal approval modifier of plus two. Don't even need to roll the die. Because if you roll more than there are moors on the map, you remove the northernmost moor. You see, so let's say there were three. One, two, three. I would only remove the most northern moor. And two would still be left on the map. And that's how, from turn to turn, they can build up, much like the Vikings, you can't leave them. But luckily, this one cannot defend itself because it's the only one, and it too goes into the Deadpool. Byzantium, there's no Byzantium units on the map. And where it says England, this is the emergency victory points. Now, if my taxation level equals the victory point threshold, uh, sorry, yeah, equals the taxation threshold, which is 21 for this turn, and it doesn't, I would get an EVP. It doesn't, so I don't. And finally, Vatican. If you're in Rome with the Pope and your approval rating is plus two, you are crowned Holy Roman Emperor. And with her overriding eye for detail, Amabel has ensured that we can change this image of Charlemagne to the older image of Charlemagne. What like so. How wonderful is that? I absolutely adore that. And it's that kind of thing that brings a lot of joy. It's just great detail. Love it. That's the diplomacy phase over with. So what's next? It's the turn end phase, folks. By the way, now that I'm Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor This die roll modifier, which is plus one, now becomes plus one for every other region, apart from pagans, and a plus two in the papal states. Brilliant. And we increase taxation by three, one, two, three, which is now 18. And in the levy phase, if we can afford it, <laughs> we can purchase an extra battle unit. But we come to the turn end phase. And as I said before, it is on the player aid, but I do recommend very strongly, because I messed it up a couple of times, using 
the turn end phase explanation in the rule book. So that's what I'm going to do. First of all, we de-escalate if we possibly can. Each region that has a finished church, so that's here, here, and here, and no Vikings or Moors. Look, uh, that's why we don't want them to encroach here. And we got rid of the Moors here. We can eliminate the topmost enemy unit from each stack that doesn't have a leader. So, as a church, eliminate a topmost unit there. Goes in the Deadpool. Eliminate a topmost unit. Got a church. There's no moors. Into the Deadpool. Eliminate a topmost unit in this green area. Into the Deadpool. The power of the churches. Now we can eliminate the topmost enemy unit from any stack anywhere with three or more units and no leader. Well, can't do it because you can't do it in pagan areas. Doesn't apply to the two pagan areas. And there aren't any big stacks anywhere else, not yet. And finally, you can eliminate the topmost enemy unit in any box that's occupied by Charlemagne. There's no enemy units there. Or a marquee. There. Eliminate the topmost unit, which is that one. We've de-escalated the map. Now we have to resolve the Deadpool. I won't go through it in too much detail, but the Viking markers go into the hostile cup. And that's how they keep building, by the way. The Moors, and there's only one of them. Al-Andalus is at peace, so it goes in the unfriendly cup. If it was at tension on the other side, it would go into the hostile cup. Byzantium, we have no Byzantine units in the Deadpool. Intrigue markers, stay there. Turn end markers, go in the hostile cup. So you're back to four turn end markers in there. All pagans go in the hostile cup. There's going to be tons of pagans come out of the hostile cup this turn. Blue units always go into the friendly cup. That's the only one. <laughs> Green. This is the green area, so we so we look at the green region, like we did the other regions, look at the green region, because that's where they belong. If there's a finished church and no enemies, and there aren't, they go into the friendly cup. And you see, it'll be a while now, hopefully, before they work their way back to the hostile cup and come out again. So that's the idea of the three cup system. Two more to check. One is purple. There's no church. There is a Frankish presence. A Frankish presence is either a church, a marquee, or Charlemagne. There is a Frankish presence. It goes in the unfriendly cup. As does this one, because although there's a church, there's also an enemy unit there as well. So it goes in the unfriendly cup rather than the friendly cup. And that's it. The Deadpool is resolved. Now we have to collect taxes. Now I've noticed people forget this. And this is why some people have run more short of money than other people. Although the money is a constant issue and keeps getting drained down to zero. So we have 18 is our tax level. So we earn 18 cash. Subtract one for each box occupied by the Moors. That's nothing. Subtract one for each Viking piece on the map. Again, got to keep getting rid of them. 
there is none. And subtract one for each enemy leader. We got rid of all these, didn't we? We massacred them. There's just one enemy leader left. Normally, uh, through the game up to now, I've had to subtract three, four, that kind of thing. But I only need to subtract one. So we're down to 17 cash. Not bad, quite pleased with that. But now we have to pay our upkeep. One for each marquee, and now we have three. One, two, three. By the way, I forgot to put my taxation level up by two. I did one, two, when I put that marquee in place here when I created him. Therefore, I would have two more coins, wouldn't I? Because I didn't get the taxation level right. I hope you understand that. When that marquee was created, I should have increased the tax level by two. One for each church, one, two, three. One for each level three Scara. That's the only thing you have to pay upkeep for. You've got expensive armor and horses and trappings and that kind of thing. And I've got three of those. One, two, three, they're expensive. Which puts me down to 10. Now, finally, or almost finally, I earn my victory points. One per level four battle unit. I don't have any. If I did, I would earn victory points for them and they would then retire. One for each region that's free of enemy units, moors and Vikings. This is free of enemy units. So that's one point there. This, so that's two points. They each have enemy units in them. So that's two victory points. One, two. Remember how we lost six victory points earlier in the game when we were massacring, massacring people over here. I'm just hoping I can build them up now. One per intrigue marker in the Deadpool. One, two. If Charmaine is Ho Holy Roman Emperor, I get one. And King of the Lombards, I get one. He's both. One, two. We now go up to 60. One per marquee in play. One, two, three of them. 63. One per finished church in a region that's free of Vikings. One. Two, three. One, two, three. And finally, one for each five cash rounded down. And we've got 10 cash, so we get two. So we finish on 68 victory points. To move on to the next turn, we needed 60. I cut it fine. When I lost six, uh, six points because of the massacre, knowing that I should hopefully be able to build it all up again, and we have. So we meet the threshold. Just got to count our minimum army strength because we need a minimum our army strength of 44. I'll just count them. 4, 10, 22. 31, 43, and how many do I need? 44! I've got to make the difference up, which is one, by losing a victory point. <laughs> it still leaves us on 60, uh, 67 victory points. And then finally, we move two friendly units from the friendly cup to the unfriendly cup. And the big one is you move six from the unfriendly cup. Now do you see how these all come together? Six into the hostile cup. One, two, three, four.
five, six. That's a nicely packed hostile cup, ready for the next turn. And finally then, we move to the next turn, turn nine, where we're on, as I said, 67 victory points. And our threshold for the end of this turn is 75. There'll be no more forced conversion massacres this turn, that's for sure. Wow, so what do I think of Charlemagne, Master of Europe. Look, um, first of all, I'll just say once more, it's a beautiful looking game. It's given me a lot of joy. Even setting it up has given me a lot of joy. It's tough. The balance, the spinning plates is really tough. This three cup system is amazing. The way things keep going from friendly to unfriendly. And you know that the unfriendly cup is getting full and he's going to spill over into the hostile cup and they're going to come pouring onto the board and it's going to get harder and harder. What makes it harder and harder is these threshold markers on the turn track. Each turn, stretching it, your tax threshold goes up, your minimum army strength goes up and more importantly, your victory strength goes up. Sorry, your victory points threshold goes up and if you don't meet it and you've not the EVP to make up the, the balance the game ends you've lost there are many strategies and you're going to have to be quite lucky to fall on them fairly early again it's one of those games where you can only learn how every single decision you make has some kind of impact on the game either by bringing out hostile forces or altering your victory point level reducing your money and certainly in the early part of the game as I think I mentioned before in those first few moves you're going to be running all over the map because you sort of want to do everything but quickly realizing that leaders are going to be taking cash off you every turn so you're going to spend Charmaine anyway here, most of your time in the pagan areas, laying siege to these guys. You need to do it because you need the money that the pillaging gives you. But then again, you need to be traveling elsewhere as well to defeat other enemies that pop up all over the board. But for that, you do have the help of the Marquis, but then you have to travel to an area away from the pagan areas to be able to do that, to create marquee and building churches. Okay, I built three of them, but you can only build a church in the region where Charlemagne ends up. So you need to keep fighting the pagans, but you need to keep moving around the board too. And all the time meeting all those thresholds every turn. This is a killer of a game. It's a genius of a game. We even have, with the Moors here, just a little bit, just a hint of a States of Siege kind of mechanic going on. And you can even argue that with the Vikings here, the way that you've got to keep them down so that they don't spill over into the next region. This has been Charlemagne, Master of Europe from Hollandspiel Games. And I love it. So... Thanks for watching. It's been a real joy to present. I hope you enjoyed it. If you need more, more rules and things like that, let me know. But otherwise, I'll see you in the next video for something yet again, very, very different. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.